special episode this morning. It's about 4 a.m. and most of the residents around here are asleep, so I'm going to have to keep quiet. But today, we're going to go over how to shoot a comet. My name's Rowan, and let's get started. So tonight I'm going to be imaging Comet Swan, and to get started, I have to set up the telescope. So I'm going to quickly do a time lapse. You can see how I set it up. So I'm setting up with a polar drift line at the moment and I'm using PHD2 on my laptop here with my guide camera and it's watching the stars and seeing how far up my drift line is from optimal. And we can go through how to do that in another tutorial on my channel shortly. But for now, let's concentrate on what's happening tonight. So in about 15 minutes, Comet C2020 F8 Swan is going to rise above the apartments to my east and I'll get about an hour's worth of imagery on it before the sun comes up and washes it out completely. Now, as of today, which is the 3rd of May, this is a Southern Hemisphere only comet. But within about a week or two, this will be visible in the Northern Hemisphere only. It is currently really low in the East in the Southern Hemisphere and we only get a couple of hours on it before the sun comes up and it is drifting northerly. So for you guys in the Northern Hemisphere, keep your eye on this because it is only going to be getting brighter and brighter. It, at the moment, it is almost visible to the naked eye. If you're in a dark spot, you'll be able to make this out quite easily with binoculars or with a small little telescope, let alone a large one or an imaging setup. So my polar alignment's looking pretty good now. So the next thing you'll need to do is know where the comet is. Now, I looked this up beforehand and I'd highly recommend that before you get started, you look up in a software like Stellarium or even a little phone app if you have one of those sky apps on your phone. Look at where the comet is because every night the comet is changing its location a lot. It moves very quickly in the sky. So you need to get up-to-date coordinates on the RA and deck of where that comet is. So before you can start imaging a comet, you need to know where it is in the sky. And comets move really quickly compared to other stars. They don't just stay in one place the whole time. So for this, I'm going to be using a program called Stellarium. Stellarium is a free download and works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So by default, Stellarium doesn't have all comets listed in it. So to do so, we need to go over here to the configuration window. Under the configuration, you wanna go plugins, scroll down to the solar systems editor, configure, solar system, import orbital elements in MPC format. Online search, and here, we're going to search through the Minor Planet and Comet Service database to add the comets into Stellarium. So if you're looking for a different comet in the future, use that comet's name. But here, we're going to do C2020 F8 search. And you see here, this one has come up. So you can click it and you want to say update existing objects because as time goes on and an comet's orbital period gets refined due to more observations, it will change. So you will want to update this usually the day of your imaging session so that you have the most up-to-date details. So you click add and now we're done. We can close all these, go over to the search window, type in swan and there we go. It'll swing us around and we can see in the east at about 4 a.m. here, it's just above the horizon. And if we zoom in here, we can get an estimated location of it. 
Now, finally, what you'll want to do here is you want to take note of the RA and DEC J2000 numbers. This right ascension here of 12, 44, and negative 11, 11, these are the numbers that you will need to put into your coordinate system, either on your mount or by using Stellarium or some other software that you integrate with to point your telescope at the comet. And these will change over time. You can see here, if I fast forward here, these change a lot. So you'll need to accurately track that down to the minute that you are currently wanting to image for. So now that your telescope is pointing in the right direction, it's time to capture the data. And here we have two images of Comet Swan. These are raw images. Uh, they have not been altered in any way other than being debayered and having some automatic background extraction to normalize the colors in them. So on the left, we have a 15 second image and on the right, we have a one minute image. And traditionally, when you're taking astrophotography images, you want to take uh, longer exposures. You know, we're usually talking about minutes, um, but with comets, it's very different. So with a comet, lots changes in a short period of time, both the uh, comet's location in space, as well as the comet's tail. The comet's tail is constantly changing as the comet moves. And to capture the fine detail in that, you really want to take short exposures. Also, if you're tracking the stars, then the comet's going to move throughout your image. And you don't want to have a trail of the comet head. You want that comet head to be as short and crisp as possible. And that can only happen if you're keeping your exposures really quick. If the comet's bright enough or your gear allows you to actually track the comet, then you can extend that exposure time out further as your comet head will still be nice and crisp, but you will start to lose some detail in the tail if you let that go out too long. And what we can see here in these two images is that the comet is actually really bright. Comet Swan is a very bright comet. Even the tail uh, is quite bright compared to the background sky. And I should say that these were taken under bottle eight to bottle nine skies and some moon glow. So um, this is about as bad a situation as you can get when imaging a comet. Um, I hope for the rest of you out there when you try and image it, it is not the full moon and you're not dealing with as much light pollution as I am. And that will definitely help you gain a lot more contrast between this tail and the background data here, which uh, for me is very bright. Um, but you can see the main differences between the two images here is the one on the right, the 60 second image, has a lot more star detail. But we really don't care about that star detail because we're here to image the comet. And you will notice that the head of the comet on this 60 second image here, um, it's a lot larger than the head of the comet on the 15 second image. And if we zoom into uh, the one to one scale here, um, we can see that that's actually because the 60 second image is overexposed. Um, we're actually losing detail in this image compared to the 15 second one. And we can show that quite easily. If we create new versions of each of these images and uh, re remove the stretching. So uh, the images were originally stretched so that you could see all the detail in them. This is them in an unstretched situation here. And if we zoom in, we can clearly see that uh, even in both of these images, the comet is bright enough to see unstretched. And that means it's still overexposed, even in a 15 second image. So the difficulty with this comet and with most comets is getting a, a, enough detail in the tail without overexposing the, the head or the coma of the comet. And if we really zoom in here on the 60 second one, we compared to the 15 second one, um, we can actually see that the comet is quite elongated. Now at 60 seconds, I was tracking the stars and you can see movement in that comet. And that blurs out those details quite dramatically. Um, we can see that a number of pixels here have uh, been affected by the comet. And that means that the tail as well um, has moved a lot in that time. And I'm losing detail in the tail. Whereas in the 15 second one, there's a much more central circle. Um, it looks much more like what a comet should. So really you want to keep those exposures short. And I would recommend if you're in a, um, a site that is light polluted, then keep those images even shorter and use your gain 
to adjust your exposure and ensure that you're getting the right amount of star versus comet signal ratio. So what would I recommend in terms of final numbers to shoot at? Well, on the ASI294, which is the camera that I was using, and I, uh, bear in mind I was shooting at f5.3, um, I ended up choosing about 30 seconds and gain of 120, and this was at negative 10 degrees Celsius on the cooled camera. And I might even go shorter if I was to do this again. Um, I really like how the 15 second ones look. Um, they're really nice and crisp. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to say this, but you're going to have to experiment as every comet is different. The brightness of it is different. The tail is different. Um, the background that you're shooting it against, the moon situation is different. These will all impact how you shoot the comet. But the one thing that is similar to all of them is that you want to keep those exposures as short as you can. And finally, how to edit an image of a comet. Here's a quick time lapse of me doing an initial edit of Comet C2020 F8 Swan.